Chapter Twenty Four of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Just as the sun began to sink, several little pages came out of the house and, with low salutations, distributed among the guests daintily embossed and painted programs of the tableaux vivants prepared for their diversion in the extemporized bijou theatre numbers of people rose at once from their chairs on the lawn eager for this new spectacle and began to scramble along and hustle one another in that effective style of high breeding so frequently exhibited at her majesty's drawing-rooms i with sibyl hastily preceded the impatient pushing crowd for i wished to find a good seat for my beautiful betrothed before the room became full to overflowing there proved however to be plenty of accommodation for everybody what space there was seemed capable of limitless expansion and all the spectators were comfortably placed without difficulty soon we were all studying our programs with considerable interest for the titles of the tableau were somewhat original and mystifying they were eight in number and were respectively headed society bravery ancient and modern a lost angel the autocrat a corner of hell seeds of corruption his latest purchase and faith and materialism it was in the theatre that everyone became at last conscious of the weirdly beautiful character of the music that had been surging round them all day seated under one roof in more or less enforced silence and attention the vague and frivolous throng grew hushed and passive the society smirk passed off certain faces that were as trained to grin as their tongues were trained to lie. The dreadful giggle of the unwedded man-hunter was no longer heard. And soon the most exaggerated fashion-plate of a woman forgot to rustle her gown. The passionate vibrations of a violin cello, superbly played to a double harp accompaniment, throbbed on the stillness with a beseeching depth of sound and people listened, I saw, almost breathlessly, entranced, as it were, against their wills, and staring as though they were hypnotized, in front of them, at the gold curtain with its familiar motto, All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Before we had time to applaud the violoncello solo, however, the music changed, and the mirthful voices of violins and flutes rang out in a waltz of the giddiest and sweetest tune. At the same instant a silvery bell tinkled, and the curtain parted noiselessly in twain, disclosing the first tableau, society. An exquisite female figure, arrayed in evening dress of the richest and most extravagant design, stood before us, her hair crowned with diamonds, and her bosom blazing with the same lustrous gems. Her head was slightly raised, her lips were parted in a languid smile. In one hand she held uplifted a glass of foaming champagne. Her gold-slippered foot trod on an hourglass. Behind her, catching convulsively at the folds of her train, crouched another woman in rags, pinched and wretched, with starvation depicted in her face. A dead child lay near. And, overshadowing this group, were two supernatural shapes, one in scarlet, the other in black vast and almost beyond the stature of humanity the scarlet figure represented anarchy and its blood-red fingers were advanced to clutch the diamond crown from society's brow the sable-robed form was death and even as we looked it slowly raised its steely dart in act to strike the effect was weird and wonderful and the grim lesson the picture conveyed was startling enough to make a very visible impression no one spoke no one applauded, but people moved restlessly and fidgeted on their seats, and there was an audible sigh of relief as the curtain closed. Opening again, it displayed the second tableau, Bravery, Ancient and Modern. This was in two scenes. The first one depicted a nobleman of Elizabeth's time, with rapier drawn, his foot on the prostrate body of a coarse ruffian who had evidently, from the grouping, insulted a woman whose slight figure was discerned shrinking timidly away from the contest. This was ancient bravery, and it changed rapidly to modern, showing us an enervated, narrow-shouldered, pallid dandy in opera coat and hat, 
smoking a cigarette and languidly appealing to a bulky policeman to protect him from another young noodle of his own class, similarly attired, who was represented as sneaking round a corner in abject terror. We all recognized the force of the application, and were in a much better humor with this pictured satire than we had been at the lesson of society. Next followed a lost angel, in which was shown a great hall in the palace of a king, where there were numbers of brilliantly attired people, all grouped in various attitudes, and evidently completely absorbed in their own concerns, so much so as to be entirely unconscious of the fact that in their very midst stood a wondrous angel, clad in dazzling white, with a halo round her fair hair, and a glory as of the sunset on her half-drooping wings. Her eyes were wistful, her face was pensive and expectant. She seemed to say, Will the world ever know that I am here? Somehow, as the curtain slowly closed again, amid loud applause, for the picture was extraordinarily beautiful, I thought of Mavis Clare and sighed. Sybil looked up at me. Why do you sigh? she said. It is a lovely fancy, but the symbol is wasted in the present audience. No one with education believes in angels nowadays. True, I assented, yet there was a heaviness at my heart, for her words reminded me of what I would rather have forgotten, namely her own admitted lack of all religious faith. The autocrat was the next tableau, and represented an emperor enthroned. At his footstool knelt a piteous crowd of the starving and oppressed, holding up their lean hands to him, clasped in anguished petition. But he looked away from them as though he saw them not. His head was turned to listen to the side whisper of one who seemed, by the courtly bend and flattering smile, to be his adviser and confidant. Yet that very confidant held secreted behind his back a drawn dagger, ready to strike his sovereign to the heart. Russia, whispered one or two of the company, as the scene was obscured, but the scarcely breathed suggestion quickly passed into a murmur of amazement and awe, as the curtain parted again to disclose a corner of hell. This tableau was indeed original, and quite unlike what might have been imagined as the conventional treatment of such a subject. What we saw was a black and hollow cavern, glittering alternately with the flashings of ice and fire. Huge icicles drooped from above, and pale flames leapt stealthily into view from below, and within the dark embrasure the shadowy form of a man was seated, counting out gold, or what seemed to be gold. Yet as coin after coin slipped through his ghostly fingers, each one was seen to change to fire, and the lesson thus pictured was easily read. The lost soul had made its own torture, and was still at work intensifying and increasing its own fiery agony. Much as this scene was admired for its Rembrandt effect of light and shade, I personally was glad when it was curtained from view. There was something in that dreadful face of the doomed sinner that reminded me forcibly and unpleasantly of those ghastly three I had seen in my horrid vision on the night of Viscount Linton's suicide. Seeds of Corruption was the next picture, and showed us a young and beautiful girl in her early teens, lying on a luxurious couch en déshabille, with a novel in her hand, of which the title was plainly seen by all, a novel well known to every one present, and the work of a much-praised living author. Round her, on the floor, and cast carelessly on a chair at her side, were other novels of the same sexual type. All their titles turned toward us, and the names of their authors equally made manifest. "'What a daring idea!' said a lady in the seat immediately behind me. "'I wonder if any of those authors are present.' "'If they are, they won't mind,' replied the man next to her, with a smothered laugh. "'Those sort of writers would merely take it as a first-class advertisement.' Sybil looked at the tableau with a pale face and wistful eyes. "'That is a true picture,' she said under her breath. Geoffrey, it is painfully true. I made no answer. I thought I knew to what she alluded, but alas, I did not know how deeply the seeds of corruption had been sown in her own nature, or what a harvest they would bring forth. The curtain closed, to open again almost immediately on his latest purchase. Here we were shown the interior of a luxurious modern drawing-room, where about eight or ten men were assembled in fashionable evening dress. They had evidently just risen from a card-table, 
and one of them, a dissipated-looking brute, with a wicked smile of mingled satire and triumph on his face, was pointing to his purchase, a beautiful woman. She was clad in glistening white like a bride, but she was bound, as prisoners are bound, to an upright column, on which the grinning head of a marble Silenus leered above her. Her hands were tied tightly together with chains of diamonds. Her waist was bound with thick ropes of pearls. A wide collar of rubies encircled her throat, and from bosom to feet she was netted about and tied with strings of gold and gems. Her head was flung back defiantly with an assumption of pride and scorn. Her eyes alone expressed shame, self-contempt, and despair at her bondage. The man who owned this white slave was represented, by his attitude, as cataloguing and appraising her points for the approval and applause of his comrades, whose faces variously and powerfully expressed the differing emotions of lust, cruelty, envy, callousness, derision, and selfishness, more admirably than the most gifted painter could imagine. A capital type of most fashionable marriages, I heard someone say. Rather, another voice replied, the orthodox happy couple to the life. I glanced at Sybil. She looked pale, but smiled as she met my questioning eyes. A sense of consolation crept warmly about my heart as I remembered that now she had, as she told me, learnt to love, and that therefore her marriage with me was no longer a question of material advantage alone. She was not my purchase, she was my love, my saint, my queen, or so I chose to think, in my foolishness and vanity. The last tableau of all was now to come, faith and materialism, and it proved to be the most startling of the series. The auditorium was gradually darkened, and the dividing curtain disclosed a ravishingly beautiful scene by the seashore. A full moon cast its tranquil glow over the smooth waters and rising on rainbow wings from earth toward the skies one of the loveliest creatures ever dreamed of by poet or painter floated angel-like upwards her hands holding a cluster of lilies clasped to her breast her lustrous eyes full of divine joy hope and love exquisite music was heard soft voices sang in the distance a chorale of rejoicing heaven and earth sea and air all seemed to support the aspiring spirit as she soared higher and higher, in an ever-deepening rapture, when, as we all watched that aerial flying form with a sense of the keenest delight and satisfaction, a sudden crash of thunder sounded, the scene grew dark, and there was a distant roaring of angry waters. The light of the moon was eclipsed, the music ceased, a faint lurid glow of red shone at first dimly, then more vividly and materialism declared itself, a human skeleton, bleached white and grinning ghastly mirth upon us all. While we yet looked, the skeleton itself dropped to pieces, and one long twining worm lifted its slimy length from the wreck of bones, another working its way through the eye-holes of the skull. Murmurs of genuine horror were heard in the auditorium. People on all sides rose from their seats, one man in particular, a distinguished professor of sciences, pushed past me to get out, muttering crossly, This may be very amusing to some of you, but to me it is disgusting. Like your own theories, my dear professor, said a rich laughing voice, as Lucio met him on his way, and the Bijou Theatre was again flooded with cheerful light. They are amusing to some, and disgusting to others. Pardon me, I speak of course in jest but I designed that tableau specially in your honor. Oh, you did, did you? growled the professor. Well, I didn't appreciate it. Yet you should have done, for it is quite scientifically correct, declared Lucio, laughing still. Faith, with the wings, whom you saw joyously flying towards an impossible heaven, is not scientifically correct. Have you not told us so? But the skeleton and the worms were quite of your cult. No materialist can deny the correctness of that complexion to which we all must come at last. Positively, some of the ladies look quite pale. How droll it is that while everybody, to be fashionable and in favor with the press, must accept materialism as the only creed, they should invariably become affrighted, or let us say offended, at the natural end of the body, as completed by material agencies. "'Well, it was not a pleasant subject, that last tableau,' 
said Lord Elton, as he came out of the theatre with Diana Chesney hanging confidently on his arm. You cannot say it was festal. It was, for the worms, replied Lucio gaily. Come, Miss Chesney, and you, Tempest, come along with Lady Sybil. Let us go out in the grounds again and see my will-o'-the-wisps lighting up. Fresh curiosity was excited by this remark. The people quickly threw off the gruesome and tragic impression made by the strange tableau just witnessed, and poured out of the house into the gardens, chattering and laughing more noisily than ever. It was just dusk, and as we reached the open lawn, we saw an extraordinary number of small boys, clad in brown, running about with will-o'-the-wisp lanterns. Their movements were swift and perfectly noiseless. They leapt, jumped, and twirled like little gnomes over flower-beds, under shrubberies, and along the edges of paths and terraces, many of them climbing trees with the rapidity and agility of monkeys, and wherever they went they left behind them a trail of brilliant light. Soon, by their efforts, all the grounds were illuminated with a magnificence that could not have been equaled even by the historic feats at Versailles. Tall oaks and cedars were transformed to pyramids of fire blossoms. Every branch was loaded with colored lamps in the shape of stars. Rockets hissed up into the clear space, showering down bouquets, wreaths, and ribbons of flame. Lines of red and azure ran glowingly along the grass borders, and amid the enthusiastic applause of the assembled spectators, eight huge fire fountains of all colors sprang up in various corners of the garden, while an enormous golden balloon, dazzlingly luminous, ascended slowly into the air, and remained poised above us, sending from its glittering car hundreds of gem-like birds and butterflies on fiery wings, that circled round and round for a moment and then vanished. While we were yet loudly clapping, the splendid effect of this sky spectacle, a troop of beautiful girl dancers in white came running across the grass, waving long silvery wands that were tipped with electric stars, and to the sound of strange tinkling music, seemingly played in the distance on glass bells, they commenced a fantastic dance of the wildest yet most graceful character. Every shade of opaline color fell upon their swaying figures from some invisible agency as they tripped and whirled, and each time they waved their wands, ribbons and flags of fire were unrolled and tossed high in the air, where they gyrated for a long time like moving hieroglyphs. The scene was now so startling, so fairy-like and wonderful, that we were well-nigh struck speechless with astonishment, too fascinated and absorbed even to applaud. We had no conception how time went, or how rapidly the night descended, till all at once, without the least warning, an appalling crash of thunder burst immediately above our heads, and a jagged fork of lightning tore the luminous fire balloon to shreds. Two or three women began to scream, whereupon Lucio advanced from the throng of spectators, and stood in full view of all, holding up his hand. "'Stage thunder, I assure you,' he said playfully, in a clear, somewhat scornful voice. It comes and goes at my bidding. Quite a part of the game, believe me. These sort of things are only toys for children. Again, again, ye petty elements, he cried, laughing, and lifting his handsome face and flashing eyes to the dark heavens. Roar your best and loudest. Roar, I say. Such a terrific boom and clatter answered him as baffled all description. It was as if a mountain of rock had fallen into ruins. But having been assured that the deafening noise was stage thunder merely, the spectators were no longer alarmed, and many of them expressed their opinion that it was wonderfully well done. After this there gradually appeared against the sky a broad blaze of red light like the reflection of some great prairie fire. It streamed apparently upward from the ground, bathing us all where we stood in its blood-like glow. The white-robed dancing girls waltzed on and on, their arms entwined, their lovely faces irradiated by the lurid flame, while above them now flew creatures with black wings, bats and owls and great night-moths that flapped and fluttered about for all the world as if they were truly alive and not mere stage properties. Another flash of lightning and one more booming thud of thunder, and lo, the undisturbed and fragrant night was about us, clear dewy and calm. The young moon smiled pensively in a cloudless heaven. All the dancing girls had vanished. The crimson glow had changed to a pure silvery radiance, 
and an array of pretty pages in eighteenth-century costumes of pale pink and blue stood before us with lighted flaming torches, making a long triumphal avenue, down which Lucio invited us to pass. "'On, on, fair ladies and gallant gentlemen,' he cried. "'This extemporized path of light leads, not to heaven, no, that were far too dull an ending, but to supper. On, follow your leader.' Every eye was turned on his fine figure and striking countenance, as with one hand he beckoned the guests. Between the double line of lit torches he stood, a picture for a painter, with those dark eyes of his alit with such strange mirth as could not be defined, and the sweet, half-cruel, wonderfully attractive smile playing upon his lips. And with one accord the whole company trooped pell-mell after him, shouting their applause and delight. Who could resist him? not one in that assemblage at least. There are few saints in society. As I went with the rest, I felt as though I were in some gorgeous dream. My senses were all in a whirl. I was giddy with excitement and could not stop to think, or to analyze the emotions by which I was governed. Had I possessed the force or the will to pause and consider, I might possibly have come to the conclusion that there was something altogether beyond the ordinary power of man displayed in the successive wonders of this brilliant gala. But I was, like all the rest of society, bent merely on the pleasure of the moment, regardless of how it was procured, what it cost me, or how it affected others. How many I see and know to-day among the worshippers of fashion and frivolity who are acting precisely as I acted then! indifferent to the welfare of every one save themselves, grudging every penny that is not spent on their own advantage or amusement, and too callous to even listen to the sorrows or difficulties or joys of others when these do not, in some way, near or remote, touch their own interests. They waste their time, day after day, in selfish trifling, willfully blind and unconscious to the fact that they are building up their own fate in the future that future which will prove all the more a terrible reality in proportion to the extent of our presumption in daring to doubt its truth. More than four hundred guests sat down to supper in the largest pavilion, a supper served in the most costly manner and furnished with luxuries that represented the utmost pitch of extravagance. I ate and drank with Sybil at my side, hardly knowing what I said or did in the whirling excitement of the hour the opening of champagne bottles, the clink of glasses, the clatter of plates, the loud hum of talk interspersed with monkey-like squeals or goat-like whinnies of laughter, overridden at intervals by the blare of trumpet music and drums. All these sounds were as so much noise of rushing waters in my ears, and I often found myself growing abstracted and in a manner confused by the din. I did not say much to Sybil, one cannot very well whisper sentimental nothings in the ear of one's betrothed when she is eating ortolans and truffles. Presently, amid all the hubbub, a deep bell struck twelve times, and Lucio stood up at the end of one of the long tables, a full glass of foaming champagne in his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, there was a sudden silence. Ladies and gentlemen, he repeated, his brilliant eyes flashing derisively, I thought, over the whole well-fed company. Midnight has struck, and the best of friends must part. But before we do so, let us not forget that we have met here to wish all happiness to our host, Mr. Geoffrey Tempest, and his bride-elect, the Lady Sybil Elton. Here there was vociferous applause. It is said, continued Lucio, by the makers of dull maxims, that fortune never comes with both hands full. But in this case the adage is proved false and put to shame. For our friend has not only secured the pleasures of wealth, but the treasures of love and beauty combined. Limitless cash is good, but limitless love is better. And both these choice gifts have been bestowed on the betrothed pair whom today we honor. I will ask you to give them a hearty round of cheering, and then it must be good night indeed, though not farewell, for with the toast of the bride and bridegroom elect I shall also drink to the time, not far distant perhaps, when I shall see some of you, if not all of you again, and enjoy even more of your charming company than I have done to-day. He ceased amid a perfect hurricane of applause, and then every one rose and turned toward the table where I sat with Sybil, and naming our names aloud, drank wine, 
the men joining in hearty shouts of hip 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 hurrah yet as i bowed repeatedly in response to the storm of cheering and while sibyl smiled and bent her graceful head to right and left my heart sank suddenly with a sense of fear was it my fancy or did i hear peals of wild laughter circling round the brilliant pavilion and echoing away far away into distance i listened glass in hand hip 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 hurrah shouted my guests with gusto ha 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 seemed shrieked and yelled in my ears from the outer air struggling against this delusion i got up and returned thanks for myself and my future bride in a few brief words which were received with fresh salvos of applause and then we all became aware that lucio had sprung up again in his place and was standing high above us with one foot on the table and the other on the chair confronting us with a fresh glass of wine in his hand filled to the brim what a face he had at that moment what a smile the parting cup my friends he exclaimed to our next merry meeting with plaudits and laughter the guests eagerly and noisily responded and as they drank the pavilion was flooded by a deep crimson illumination as of fire every face looked blood red every jewel on every woman flashed like a living flame for one brief instant only then it was gone and there followed a general stampede of the company everybody hurrying as fast as they could into the carriages that waited in long lines to take them to the station the last two special trains to london being at one a m and one thirty i bade sibyl and her father a hurried good night diana chesney went in the same carriage with them full of ecstatic thanks and praise to me for the splendors of the day which she described in her own fashion as knowing how to do it and then the departing crowd of vehicles began to thunder down the avenue as they went an arch of light suddenly spanned willowsmere court from end to end of its red gables blazing with all the colors of the rainbow in the middle of which appeared letters of pale blue and gold forming what i had hitherto considered as a funeral device sic transit gloria mundi vale but after all it was as fairly applicable to the ephemeral splendors of a feat as it was to the more lasting marble solemnity of a sepulchre and i thought little or nothing about it so perfect were all the arrangements and so admirably were the servants trained that the guests were not long in departing and the grounds were soon not only empty but dark not a vestige of the splendid illuminations was left anywhere and i entered the house fatigued and with a dull sense of bewilderment and fear on me which i could not explain i found lucio alone in the smoking-room at the further end of the oak-panelled hall a small cosily curtained apartment with a deep bay window which opened directly on to the lawn he was standing in this embrasure with his back to me but he turned swiftly round as he heard my steps and confronted me with such a wild white tortured face that i recoiled from him startled lucio you are ill i exclaimed you have done too much to-day perhaps i have he answered in a hoarse unsteady voice and i saw a strong shudder convulse him as he spoke then gathering himself together as if it were by an effort he forced a smile don't be alarmed my friend it is nothing nothing but the twinge of an old deep-seated malady a troublesome disease that is rare among men and hopelessly incurable what is it i asked anxiously for his death-like pallor alarmed me he looked at me fixedly his eyes dilating and darkening and his hand fell with a heavy pressure on my shoulder a very strange illness he said in the same jarring accents remorse have you never heard of it geoffrey neither medicine nor surgery are of any avail it is the worm that dieth not and the flame that cannot be quenched tut let us not talk of it no one can cure me no one will i am past hope but remorse if you have it and i cannot possibly imagine why for you have surely nothing to regret is not a physical ailment i said wonderingly and physical ailments are the only ones worth troubling about you think he queried still smiling that strained and haggard smile the body is our chief care we cosset it and make much of it feed it and pamper it and guard it from so much as a pin-prick of pain if we can and thus we flatter ourselves that all is well all must be well yet 
it is but a clay chrysalis, bound to split and crumble with the growth of the moth soul within, the moth that flies with blind instinctiveness straight into the unknown and is dazzled by excess of light. Look out here, he went on with an abrupt and softer change of tone. Look out at the dreamful shadowy beauty of your gardens now. The flowers are asleep. The trees are surely glad to be disburdened of all the gaudy artificial lamps that lately hung upon their branches. There is the young moon pillowing her chin on the edge of a little cloud and sinking to sleep in the west. A moment ago there was a late nightingale awake and singing. You can feel the breath of the roses from the trellis yonder. All this is nature's work, and how much fairer and sweeter it is now than when the lights were ablaze and the blare of band music startled the small birds in their downy nests. Yet society would not appreciate this cool dusk, this happy solitude. Society prefers a false glare to all true radiance, and what is worse, it tries to make true things take a second place as adjuncts to sham ones, and there comes in the mischief. It is just like you to run down your own indefatigable labors in the splendid successes of the day. I said laughing. You may call it a false glare if you like, but it has been a most magnificent spectacle, and certainly in the way of entertainments it will never be equaled or excelled. It will make you more talked about than even your boomed book could do, said Lucio, eyeing me narrowly. Not the least doubt of that, I replied. Society prefers food and amusement to any literature, even the greatest. By the by, where are all the artistes? The musicians and dancers? Gone. Gone? I echoed amazedly. Already? Good heavens! Have they had supper? They have had everything they want, even to their pay, said Lucio, a trifle impatiently. Did I not tell you, Geoffrey, that when I undertake to do anything, I do it thoroughly or not at all? I looked at him. He smiled, but his eyes were somber and scornful. All right, I responded carelessly, not wishing to offend him have it your own way. But upon my word, to me it is all like devil's magic. What is? he asked imperturbably. Everything. The dancers, the number of servants and pages. Why, there must have been two or three hundred of them. Those wonderful tableaux, the illuminations, the supper, everything I tell you. And the most astonishing part of it now is, that all these people should have cleared out so soon. Well, if you elect to call money devil's magic, you are right said Lucio. But surely in some cases not even money could procure such perfection of detail, I began. Money can procure anything, he interrupted, a thrill of passion vibrating in his rich tone. I told you that long ago. It is a hook for the devil himself. Not that the devil could be supposed to care about world's cash personally, but he generally conceives a liking for the company of the man who possesses it. Possibly he knows what that man will do with it. I speak metaphorically, of course, but no metaphor can exaggerate the power of money. Trust no man or woman's virtue till you have tried to purchase it with a round sum in hard cash. Money, my excellent Geoffrey, has done everything for you. Remember that. You have done nothing for yourself. That's not a very kind speech, I said, somewhat vexedly. No, and why? Because it's true? I notice most people complain of unkindness when they are told a truth. It is true, and I see no unkindness in it. You've done nothing for yourself, and you're not expected to do anything except— And he laughed. Except just now get to bed and dream of the enchanting Sibyl. I confess I am tired, I said, and an unconscious sigh escaped me. And you? His gaze rested broodingly on the outer landscape. I also am tired, he responded slowly, but I never get away from my fatigue, for I am tired of myself, and I always rest badly. Good night. Good night, I answered, and then paused, looking at him. He returned my look with interest. Well? he asked expressively. I forced a smile. Well, I echoed, I do not know what I should say, except that I wish I knew you as you are. I feel that you were right in telling me once that you are not what you seem. He still kept his eyes fixed upon me. As you have expressed the wish, he said slowly, I promise you, you shall know me as I am some day. It may be well for you to know, 
for the sake of others who may seek to cultivate my company. I moved away to leave the room. Thanks for all the trouble you have taken today, I said in a lighter tone, though I shall never be able to express my full gratitude in words. If you wanted to thank anybody, thank God that you have lived through it, he replied. Why? I asked, astonished. Why? Because life hangs on a thread. A society crush is the very acme of boredom and exhaustion, and that we escape with our lives from a general guzzle and giggle is matter for thanksgiving, that's all. And God gets so few thanks as a rule that you may surely spare him a brief one for today's satisfactory ending. I laughed, seeing no meaning in his words beyond the usual satire he affected. I found Emile waiting for me in my bedroom, but I dismissed him abruptly, hating the look of his crafty and sullen face and saying I needed no attendance. Thoroughly fatigued, I was soon in bed and asleep, and the terrific agencies that had produced the splendors of the brilliant festival at which I had figured as host were not revealed to me by so much as a warning dream. End of chapter 24《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハ Not for any resolved or noble attitude in society or politics, no. I owed my fame merely to a quadruped. Phosphor won the derby. It was about a neck and neck contest between my racer and that of the Prime Minister, and for a second or so the result seemed doubtful. But as the two jockeys neared the goal, Emile, whose thin, wiry figure, clad in the brightest of bright scarlet silk, stuck to his horse as though he were a part of it. Put Phosphor to a pace he had never yet exhibited, appearing to skim along the ground at literally flying speed. The upshot being that he scored a triumphant victory, reaching the winning post a couple of yards or more ahead of his rival. Acclamations rent the air at the vigor displayed in the finish, and I became the hero of the day, the darling of the populace. I was somewhat amused at the premier's discomfiture. He took his beating rather badly. He did not know me, nor I him. I was not of his politics, and I did not care a jot for his feelings one way or the other. But I was gratified, in a certain satirical sense, to find myself suddenly acknowledged as a greater man than he, because I was the owner of the derby winner. Before I well knew where I was, I found myself being presented to the Prince of Wales, who shook hands with me and congratulated me. All the biggest aristocrats in England were willing and eager to be introduced to me. And inwardly I laughed at this exhibition of taste and culture on the part of the gentlemen of England that live at home at ease. They crowded round Phosphor, whose wild eye warned strangers against taking liberties with him, but who seemed not a whit the worse for his exertions, and who apparently was quite ready to run the race over again with equal pleasure and success. Emile's dark sly face and cruel ferret eyes were evidently not attractive to the majority of the gentlemen of the turf, though his answers to all the queries put to him were admirably ready, respectful, and not without wit. But to me, the whole sum and substance of the occasion was the fact that I, Geoffrey Tempest, once struggling author, now millionaire, was simply by virtue of my ownership of the derby winner, famous at last, or what society considers famous. That fame that secures for a man the attention of the nobility and gentry to quote from tradesmen's advertisements, and also obtains the persistent adulation and shameless pursuit of all the demi mondaines who want jewels and horses and yachts presented to them in exchange for a few tainted kisses from their carmined lips. Under the shower of compliments I received, I stood, apparently delighted, smiling, affable, and courteous. Entering into the spirit of the occasion and shaking hands with Lord That and Sir Something Nobody and His Serene Highness the Grand Duke So and So of Beerland and His Other Serene Lowness of Small Principality. 
but in my secret soul I scorned these people with their social humbug and hypocrisy, scorned them with such a deadly scorn as almost amazed myself. When presently I walked off the course with Lucio, who as usual seemed to know and be friends with everybody, he spoke in accents that were far more grave and gentle than I had ever heard him use before. With all your egotism, Geoffrey, there is something forcible and noble in your nature, something which rises up in bold revolt against falsehood and sham. Why in heaven's name do you not give it way? I looked at him amazed and laughed. Give it way? What do you mean? Would you have me tell humbugs that I know them as such, and liars that I discern their lies? My dear fellow, society would become too hot to hold me. It could not be hotter or colder than hell, if you believed in hell, which you do not, he rejoined in the same quiet voice. But I did not assume that you should say these things straight out and bluntly to give offense. An affronting candor is not nobleness, it is merely coarse. To act nobly is better than to speak. And what would you have me do? I asked curiously. He was silent for a moment and seemed to be earnestly, almost painfully considering. Then he answered, My advice will seem to you singular, Geoffrey, but if you want it, here it is. Give, as I said, the noble and what the world would call the quixotic part of your nature full way. Do not sacrifice your higher sense of what is right and just for the sake of pandering to anyone's power or influence. And say farewell to me. I am no use to you, save to humor your varying fancies, and introduce you to those great, or small, personages you wish to know for your own convenience or advantage. Believe me, it would be much better for you, and much more consoling, at the inevitable hour of death, if you were to let all this false and frivolous nonsense go, and me with it. Leave society to its own fool's whirligig of distracted follies. Put royalty in its true place and show it that all its pomp, arrogance, and glitter are worthless, and itself a nothing, compared to the upright standing of a brave soul in an honest man. And, as Christ said to the rich ruler, sell half that thou hast and give to the poor. I was silent for a minute or so out of sheer surprise, while he watched me earnestly, his face pale and expectant. A curious shock of something like compunction startled my conscience and for a brief space I was moved to a vague regret. Regret that with all the enormous capability I possessed of doing good to numbers of my fellow creatures with the vast wealth I owned, I had not attained to any higher moral attitude than that represented by the frivolous folk who make up what is called the upper ten of society. I took the same egotistical pleasure in myself and my own doings as any of them, and I was to the full as foolishly conventional, smooth-tongued, and hypocritical as they. They acted their part, and I acted mine. None of us were ever our real selves for a moment. In very truth, one of the reasons why fashionable men and women cannot bear to be alone is that a solitude in which they are compelled to look face to face upon their secret selves becomes unbearable because of the burden they carry of concealed vice and accusing shame. My emotion soon passed, however, and slipping my arm through Lucio's, I smiled as I answered. Your advice, my dear fellow, would do credit to a salvationist preacher, but it is quite valueless to me because impossible to follow. To say farewell forever to you, in the first place, would be to make myself guilty of the blackest ingratitude. In the second instance, society, with all its ridiculous humbug, is nevertheless necessary for the amusement of myself and my future wife. Royalty, moreover, is accustomed to be flattered, and we shall not be hurt by joining in the general inane chorus. Thirdly, if I did as the visionary Jew suggested— What visionary Jew? he asked, his eyes sparkling coldly. Why, Christ, of course, I rejoined lightly. The shadow of a strange smile parted his lips. It is the fashion to blaspheme, he said, a mark of brilliancy in literature and wit in society. I forgot. Pray, go on, if you did as Christ suggested. Yes, if I gave half my goods to the poor, I should not be thanked for it, or considered anything but a fool for my pains. You would wish to be thanked, he said. Naturally, most people like a little gratitude in return for benefits. They do, 
and the creator who is always giving is supposed to like gratitude also he observed nevertheless he seldom gets it i do not talk of hyperphysical nothingness i said with impatience i am speaking of the plain facts of this world and the people who live in it if one gives largely one expects to be acknowledged as generous but if i were to divide my fortune and hand half of it to the poor the matter would be chronicled in about six lines in one of the papers and society would exclaim what a fool then let us talk no more about it said lucio his brows clearing and his eyes gathering against their wonted light of mockery and mirth having won the derby you have really done all a nineteenth-century civilization expects you to do and for your reward you will be in universal demand everywhere you may hope soon to dine at marlborough house and a little backstair influence and political jobbery will work you into the cabinet if you care for it did i not tell you i would set you up as successfully as a bear who has reached the bun on the top of the slippery pole a spectacle for the envy of men and the wonder of angels well there you are triumphant a great creature geoffrey in fact you are the greatest product of the age a man with five millions and owner of the derby winner what is the glory of intellect compared to such a position as yours men envy you and as for angels if there are any you may be sure they do wonder a man's fame guaranteed by a horse is something indeed to make an angel stare he laughed uproariously and from that day he never spoke again of his singular proposition that i should part with him and let the nobler nature in me have its way i was not to know then that he had staked a chance upon my soul and lost it and that from henceforward he took a determined course with me implacably on to the appalling end my marriage took place on the appointed day in june with all the pomp and extravagant show befitting my position and that of the woman i had chosen to wed it is needless to describe the gorgeousness of the ceremony in detail any fashionable lady's paper describing the wedding of an earl's daughter to a fivefold millionaire will give an idea in hysterical rhapsody of the general effect it was an amazing scene and one in which costly millinery completely vanquished all considerations of solemnity or sacredness in the supposed divine ordinance the impressive command i require and charge ye both as you will answer at the dreadful day of judgment did not obtain half so much awed attention as the exquisite knots of pearls and diamonds which fastened the bride's silver embroidered train to her shoulders all the world and his wife were present that is the social world which imagines no other world exists though it is the least part of the community the prince of wales honored us by his presence two great dignitaries of the church performed the marriage rite resplendent in redundant fullness of white sleeve and surplice and equally imposing in the fatness of their bodies and unctuous redness of their faces and lucio was my best man he was in high almost wild spirits and during our drive to the church together had entertained me all the way with numerous droll stories mostly at the expense of the clergy when we reached the sacred edifice he said laughingly as he alighted did you ever hear it reported geoffrey that the devil is unable to enter a church because of the cross upon it or within it i have heard some such nonsense i replied smiling at the humour expressed in his sparkling eyes and eloquent features it is nonsense for the makers of the legend forgot one thing he continued dropping his voice to a whisper as we passed under the carved gothic portico the cross may be present but so is the clergyman and wherever a clergyman is the devil may surely follow i almost laughed aloud at his manner of making this irreverent observation and the look with which he accompanied it the rich tones of the organ creeping softly on the flower-scented silence however quickly solemnized my mood and while I leaned against the altar rails waiting for my bride, I caught myself wondering for the hundredth time or more at my comrade's singularly proud and kingly aspect, as with folded arms and lifted head he contemplated the lily-decked altar and the gleaming crucifix upon it, his meditative eyes bespeaking a curious mingling of reverence and contempt. One incident I remember, as standing out particularly in all the glare and glitter of the brilliant scene, and this occurred at the signing of our names in the register when sibyl a vision of angelic loveliness in all her bridal white affixed her signature to the entry 
Lucio bent towards her. As best man, I claim an old-fashioned privilege, he said, and kissed her lightly on the cheek. She blushed a vivid red, then suddenly grew ghastly pale, and with a kind of choking cry, reeled back in a dead faint in the arms of one of her bridesmaids. It was some minutes before she was restored to consciousness, but she made light both of my alarm and the consternation of her friends, and assuring us that it was nothing but the effect of the heat of the weather and the excitement of the day. She took my arm and walked down the aisle smilingly, through the brilliant ranks of her staring and envious society friends, all of whom coveted her good fortune, not because she had married a worthy or gifted man, that would have been no special matter for congratulation, but simply because she had married five millions of money. I was the appendage to the millions, nothing further. She held her head high and haughtily, though I felt her tremble as the thundering strains of the bridal march from Lohengrin poured sonorous triumph on the air. She trod on roses all the way. I remembered that, too, afterwards. Her satin slipper crushed the hearts of a thousand innocent things that must surely have been more dear to God than she, the little harmless souls of flowers, whose task in life, sweetly fulfilled, has been to create beauty and fragrance by their mere existence, expired to gratify the vanity of one woman to whom nothing was sacred. But I anticipate I was yet in my fool's dream, and imagined that the dying blossoms were happy to perish thus beneath her tread. A grand reception was held at Lord Elton's house after the ceremony, and in the midst of the chattering, the eating, and the drinking, we, my newly made wife and I, departed amid the profuse flatteries and good wishes of our friends, who, primed with the very finest champagne, made a very decent show of being sincere. The last person to say farewell to us at the carriage door was Lucio, and the sorrow I felt at parting with him was more than I could express in words. From the very hour of the dawning of my good fortune we had been almost inseparable companions. I owed my success in society, everything, even my bride herself, to his management and tact. And though I had now won for my life's partner the most beautiful of women, I could not contemplate even the temporary breaking of the association between myself and my gifted and brilliant comrade, without a keen pang of personal pain amid my nuptial joys. Leaning his arms on the carriage window, he looked in upon us both, smiling. "'My spirit will be with you both in all your journeyings,' he said. "'And when you return, I shall be one of the first to bid you welcome home. Your house-party is fixed for September, I believe?' "'Yes, and you will be the most eagerly desired guest of all invited,' I replied heartily, pressing his hand. "'Fie for shame!' he retorted laughingly. "'Be not so disloyal of speech, Geoffrey. Are you not going to entertain the Prince of Wales? And shall any one be more eagerly desired than he? No, I must play a humble third, or even fourth on your list where royalty is concerned. My princedom is, alas, not that of Wales, and the throne I might claim, if I had any one to help me, which I have not, is a long way removed from that of England. Sybil said nothing, but her eyes rested on his handsome face and fine figure with an odd wonder and wistfulness, and she was very pale. "'Good-bye, Lady Sybil,' he added gently. "'All joy be with you. To us who are left behind, your absence will seem long. But to you, ah, love gives wings to time, and what would be to ordinary folks a month of mere dull living will be for you nothing but a moment's rapture. Love is better than wealth.' You have found that out already, I know, but I think and hope that you are destined to make the knowledge more certain and complete. Think of me sometimes. Au revoir. The horses started. A handful of rice flung by the society idiot who is always at weddings rattled against the door and on the roof of the brougham, and Lucio stepped back, waving his hand. To the last we saw him, a tall, stately figure on the steps of Lord Elton's mansion surrounded by an ultra-fashionable throng, bridesmaids in bright attire and picture hats, young girls all eager and excited looking, each of them no doubt longing fervently for the day to come when they might severally manage to secure as rich a husband as myself, matchmaking mothers and wicked old dowagers, exhibiting priceless lace on their capacious bosoms and ablaze with diamonds, men with white buttonhole bouquets in their irreproachably fitting frock-coats, 
servants in gay liveries, and the usual street crowd of idle sightseers. All this cluster of faces, costumes, and flowers was piled against the grey background of the stone portico, and in the midst the dark beauty of Lucio's face and the luminance of his flashing eyes made him the conspicuous object and chief centre of attention. Then the carriage turned a sharp corner, the faces vanished, and Sybil and I realized that from henceforward we were left alone, alone to face the future and ourselves, and to learn the lesson of love, or hate, for evermore together. End of chapter 25chapter twenty six of the sorrows of satan by marie corelli this librivox recording is in the public domain i cannot now trace the slow or swift flitting by of phantasmal events wild ghosts of days or weeks that drifted past and brought me gradually and finally to a time when i found myself wandering numb and stricken and sick at heart by the shores of a lake in switzerland a small lake densely blue with apparently a thought in its depths such as is reflected in a child's earnest eye. I gazed down at the clear and glistening water almost unseeingly. The snow-peaked mountains surrounding it were too high for the lifting of my aching sight. Loftiness, purity, and radiance were unbearable to my mind, crushed as it was beneath a weight of dismal wreckage and ruin. What a fool was I ever to have believed that in this world there could be such a thing as happiness! Misery stared me in the face, lifelong misery, and no escape but death. Misery, it was the word which like a hellish groan had been uttered by the three dreadful phantoms that had once, in an evil vision, disturbed my rest. What had I done, I demanded indignantly of myself, to deserve this wretchedness which no wealth could cure? Why was fate so unjust? Like all my kind, I was unable to discern the small, yet strong links of the chain I had myself wrought, and which bound me to my own undoing. I blamed fate, or rather God, and talked of injustice, merely because I personally suffered, never realizing that what I considered unjust was but the equitable measuring forth of that eternal law which is carried out with as mathematical an exactitude as the movement of the planets, notwithstanding man's pygmy efforts to impede its fulfillment. The light wind blowing down from the snow peaks above me ruffled the placidity of the little lake by which I aimlessly strolled. I watched the tiny ripples break over its surface like the lines of laughter on a human face, and wondered morosely whether it was deep enough to drown in. For what was the use of living on, knowing what I knew, knowing that she, whom I had loved, and whom I loved still in a way that was hateful to myself, was a thing viler and more shameless in character than the veriest poor drab of the street who sells herself for current coin, that the lovely body and angel face were but an attractive disguise for the soul of a harpy, a vulture of vice. My God! An irrepressible cry escaped me as my thoughts went on and on in the never-ending circle and problem of incurable, unspeakable despair, and I threw myself down on a shelving bank of grass, that sloped toward the lake and covered my face in a paroxysm of tearless agony. Still inexorable thought worked in my brain and forced me to consider my position. Was she, was Sybil, more to blame than I myself for all the strange havoc wrought? I had married her of my own free will and choice, and she had told me beforehand, I am a contaminated creature trained to perfection in the lax morals and prurient literature of my day. Well, and so it had proved. My own blood burned with shame as I reflected how ample and convincing were the proofs. And, starting up from my recumbent posture, I paced up and down again restlessly in a fever of self-contempt and disgust. What could I do with a woman such as she, to whom I was now bound for life? Reform her? She would laugh me to scorn for the attempt. Reform myself? She would sneer at me for an effeminate milksop. Besides, was not I as willing to be degraded as she was to degrade me, a very victim to my brute passions, 
tortured and maddened by my feelings i roamed about wildly and started as if a pistol shot had been fired near me when the plash of oars sounded on the silence and the keel of a small boat grated on the shore the boatman within it respectfully begging me in mellifluous french to employ him for an hour i assented and in a minute or two was out on the lake in the middle of the red glow of sunset which turned the snow summits to points of flame and the waters to the hue of ruby wine i think the man who rowed me saw that i was in no very pleasant humour for he preserved a discreet silence and i pulling my hat partly over my eyes lay back in the stern still busy with my wretched musings only a month married and yet a sickening satiety had taken the place of the so-called deathless lover's passion there were moments even when my wife's matchless physical beauty appeared hideous to me i knew her as she was and no exterior charm could ever again cover for me the revolting nature within and what puzzled me from dawn to dusk was her polished specious hypocrisy her amazing aptitude for lies to look at her to hear her speak one would have deemed her a very saint of purity a delicate creature whom a coarse word would startle and offend a very incarnation of the sweetest and most gracious womanhood all heart and feeling and sympathy every one thought thus of her and never was there a greater error heart she had none the fact was borne in upon me two days after our marriage while we were in paris for there a telegram reached us announcing her mother's death the paralyzed countess of elton had it appeared expired suddenly on our wedding day or rather our wedding night but the earl had deemed it best to wait forty-eight hours before interrupting our hymeneal happiness with the melancholy tidings he followed his telegram by a brief letter to his daughter in which the concluding lines were these as you are a bride and are travelling abroad i should advise you by no means to go into mourning under the circumstances it is really not necessary and sibyl had readily accepted his suggestion keeping generally however to white and pale mauve colourings in her numerous and wonderful toilettes in order not to outrage the proprieties too openly in the opinions of persons known to her whom she might possibly meet casually in the foreign towns we visited no word of regret passed her lips and no tears were shed for her mother's loss she only said what a good thing her sufferings are over then with a little sarcastic smile she had added i wonder when we shall receive the elton chesney wedding cards i did not reply for i was pained and grieved at her lack of all gentle feeling in the matter and i was also to a certain extent superstitiously affected by the fact of the death occurring on our marriage day however this was now a thing of the past a month had elapsed a month in which the tearing down of illusions had gone on daily and hourly till i was left to contemplate the uncurtained bare prose of life and the knowledge that i had wedded a beautiful feminine animal with the soul of a shameless libertine here i pause and ask myself was not i also a libertine yes i freely admit it but the libertinage of a man while it may run to excess in hot youth generally resolves itself under the influence of a great love into a strong desire for undefiled sweetness and modesty in the woman beloved if a man has indulged in both folly and sin the time comes at last when if he has any good left in him at all he turns back upon himself and lashes his own vices with the scorpion whip of self-contempt till he smarts with the rage and pain of it and then aching in every pulse with his deserved chastisement he kneels in spirit at the feet of some pure true-hearted woman whose white soul like an angel hovers compassionately above him and there lays down his life saying do what you will with it it is yours and woe to her who plays lightly with such a gift or works fresh injury upon it no man even if he has in his day indulged in rapid living should choose a rapid woman for his wife he had far better put a loaded pistol to his head and make an end of it the sunset glory began to fade from the landscape as a little boat glided on over the tranquil water and a great shadow was on my mind like the shadow of that outer darkness which would soon be night again i asked myself was there no happiness possible in all the worlds just then the angelus chimed from a little chapel on the shore and as it rang a memory stirred in my brain moving me well-nigh to tears 
Mavis Clare was happy. Mavis, with her frank, fearless eyes, sweet face, and bright nature. Mavis, wearing her crown of fame as simply as a child might wear a wreath of may blossoms. She, with a merely moderate share of fortune, which even in its slight proportion was only due to her own hard, incessant work. She was happy. And I, with my millions, was wretched. How was it? Why was it? What had I done? I had lived as my compeers lived. I had followed the lead of all society. I had feasted my friends and effectually snubbed my foes. I had comported myself exactly as others of my wealth comport themselves. And I had married a woman whom most men, looking upon once, would have been proud to win. Nevertheless, there seemed to be a curse upon me. What had I missed out of life? I knew, but was ashamed to own it, because I had previously scorned what I called the dream nothings of mere sentiment. And now I had to acknowledge the paramount importance of those dream nothings out of which all true living must come. I had to realize that my marriage was nothing but the mere mating of the male and female animal, a coarse bodily union and no more, that all the finer and deeper emotions which make a holy thing of human wedlock were lacking, the mutual respect, the trusting sympathy, the lovely confidence of mind with mind the subtle inner spiritual bond which no science can analyze, and which is so much closer and stronger than the material, and knits immortal souls together when bodies decay. These things had no existence, and never would exist between my wife and me. Thus, as far as I was concerned, there was a strange blankness in the world. I was thrust back upon myself for comfort and found none. What should I do with my life, I wondered drearily, when fame, true fame, after all, with Sibyl's witch's eyes mocking my efforts? Never. If I had ever had any gifts of creative thought within me, she would have killed it. The hour was over. The boatman rowed me into land, and I paid and dismissed him. The sun had completely sunk. There were dense purple shadows darkening over the mountains, and one or two small stars faintly discernible in the east. I walked slowly back to the villa where we were staying a dependence belonging to the large hotel of the district, which we had rented for the sake of privacy and independence, some of the hotel servants being portioned off to attend upon us, in addition to my own man Morris and my wife's maid. I found Sybil in the garden, reclining in a basket chair, her eyes fixed on the afterglow of the sunset, and in her hands a book, one of the loathliest of the prurient novels that have been lately written by women to degrade and shame their sex. With a sudden impulse of rage upon me which I could not resist, I snatched the volume from her and flung it into the lake below. She made no movement of either surprise or offense. She merely turned her eyes away from the glowing heavens and looked at me with a little smile. "'How violent you are today, Geoffrey," she said. I gazed at her in somber silence. From the light hat with its pale mauve orchids that rested on her nut-brown hair, to the point of her daintily embroidered shoe, her dress was perfect, and she was perfect. I knew that, a matchless piece of womanhood. Outwardly, my heart beat. There was a sense of suffocation in my throat. I could have killed her for the mingled loathing and longing which her beauty roused in me. I am sorry, I said hoarsely, avoiding her gaze, but I hate to see you with such a book as that. You know its contents? She queried with the same slight smile. I can guess. Such things have to be written, they say, nowadays, she went on, and certainly, to judge from the commendation bestowed on these sort of books by the press, it is very evident that the wave of opinion is setting in the direction of letting girls know all about marriage before they enter upon it, in order that they may do so with their eyes wide open, very wide open. She laughed, and her laughter hurt me like a physical wound. What an old-fashioned idea the brides of the poets and sixty years ago romanticists seem now, she continued. Imagine her, a shrinking, tender creature, shy of beholders, timid of speech, wearing the emblematic veil, which in former days, you know, used to cover the face entirely, as a symbol that the secrets of marriage were as yet hidden from the maiden's innocent and ignorant eyes. Now the veil is worn flung back from the bride's brows, and she stares unabashed at everybody. Oh, yes, indeed, we know quite well what we are doing now when we marry, thanks to the new fiction. 
the new fiction is detestable i said hotly both in style and morality even as a question of literature i wonder at your condescending to read any of it the woman whose dirty book i have just thrown away and i feel no compunction for having done it is destitute of grammar as well as decency oh but the critics don't notice that she interrupted with a delicate mockery vibrating in her voice it is apparently not their business to assist in preserving the purity of the English language. What they fall into raptures over is the originality of the sexual theme, though I should have thought all such matters were as old as the hills. I never read reviews as a rule, but I did happen to come across one on the book you have just drowned, and in it the reviewer stated he had cried over it. She laughed again. Beast, I said emphatically he probably found in it some glozing over of his own vices. But you, Sybil, why do you read such stuff? How can you read it? Curiosity moved me in the first place, she answered listlessly. I wanted to see what makes a reviewer cry. Then, when I began to read, I found that the story was all about the manner in which men amuse themselves with the soiled doves of the highways and byways. And as I was not very well instructed in that sort of thing, I thought I might as well learn. You know, these unpleasant morsels of information on unsavory subjects are like the reputed suggestions of the devil. If you listen to one, you are bound to hear more. Besides, literature is supposed to reflect the time we live in, and that kind of literature, being more prevalent than anything else, we are compelled to accept and study it as the mirror of the age. With an expression on her face that was half mirth, and half scorn she rose from her seat and looked down into the lovely lake below her the fishes will eat that book she observed i hope it will not poison them if they could read and understand it what singular ideas they would have of us human beings why don't you read mavis clare's books i asked suddenly you told me you admired her so i do immensely she answered i admire her and wonder at her both together how that woman can keep her child's heart and child's faith in a world like this is more than I can understand. It is always a perfect marvel to me, a sort of supernatural surprise. You ask me why don't I read her books? I do read them. I've read them all, over and over again. But she does not write many, and one has to wait for her productions, longer than for those of most authors. When I want to feel like an angel, I read Mavis Clare but I more often am inclined to feel the other way, and then her books are merely so many worries to me. Worries? I echoed. Yes, it is worrying to find somebody believing in a God when you can't believe in him, to have beautiful faiths offered to you which you can't grasp, and to know that there is a creature alive, a woman like yourself in everything except mind, who is holding fast a happiness which you can never attain. No, not though you held out praying hands day and night and shouted wild appeals to the dull heavens. At that moment she looked like a queen of tragedy, her violet eyes ablaze, her lips apart, her breast heaving. I approached her with a strange, nervous hesitation and touched her hand. She gave it to me passively. I drew it through my arm, and for a minute or two we paced silently up and down the gravel walk. The lights from the monster hotel, which catered for us, and our wants were beginning to twinkle from basement to roof and just above the chalet we rented a triad of stars sparkled in the shape of a trefoil poor geoffrey she said presently with a quick upward glance at me i am sorry for you with all my vagaries of disposition i am not a fool and at any rate i have learned how to analyze myself as well as others i read you as easily as i read a book i see what a strange tumult your mind is in you love me and you loathe me, and the contrast of emotion makes a wreck of you and your ideals. Hush, don't speak, I know, I know. But what would you have me be, an angel? I cannot realize such a being for more than a fleeting moment of imagination. A saint? They were all martyred. A good woman? I never met one. Innocent? Ignorant? I told you before we married that I was neither. There is nothing left for me to discover as far as the relations between men and women are concerned. I have taken the measure of the inherent love of vice in both sexes. There is not a pin to choose between them. Men are no worse than women. Women no worse than men. I have discovered everything, except God. 
and I conclude no god could ever have designed such a crazy and mean business as human life. While she thus spoke, I could have fallen at her feet and implored her to be silent, for she was, unknowingly, giving utterance to some of the many thoughts in which I myself had frequently indulged, and yet, from her lips, they sounded cruel, unnatural, and callous to a degree that made me shrink from her in fear and agony. We had reached a little grove of pines, and here in the silence and shadow I took her in my arms and stared disconsolately upon the beauty of her face. Sybil, I whispered, Sybil, what is wrong with us both? How is it that we do not seem to find the loveliest side of love? Why is it that even in our kisses and embraces some impalpable darkness comes between us, so that we anger or weary each other, when we should be glad and satisfied? What is it? Can you tell? For you know the darkness is there. A curious look came into her eyes, a far away strained look of hungry yearning, mingled, as I thought, with compassion for me. Yes, it is there she answered slowly, and it is of our own mutual creation. I believe you have something nobler in your nature, Geoffrey, than I have in mine, an indefinable something that recoils from me and my theories, despite your wish and will. Perhaps if you had given way to that feeling in time, you would never have married me. You speak of the loveliest side of love. To me there is no lovely side. It is all coarse and horrible. You and I, for instance, cultured man and woman, we cannot, in marriage, get a flight beyond the common emotions of Hodge and his girl. She laughed violently and shuddered in my arms. What liars the poets are, Geoffrey! They ought to be sentenced to lifelong imprisonment for their perjuries. They help to mould the credulous beliefs of a woman's heart. In her early youth she reads their delicious assurances, and imagines that love will be all they teach a thing divine and lasting beyond earthly countings. Then comes the coarse finger of prose and the butterfly wing of poesy, and the bitterness and hideousness of complete disillusion. I held her still in my arms, with the fierce grasp of a man clinging to a spar, ere he drowns in mid-ocean. But I love you, Sybil. My wife, I love you, I said, with a passion that choked my utterance. You love me, yes, I know. But how? In a way that is abhorrent to yourself, she replied. It is not poetic love, it is man's love, and man's love is brute love. So it is, so it will be, so it must be. Moreover, the brute love soon tires, and when it dies out from satiety, there is nothing left, nothing, Geoffrey, absolutely nothing, but a blank and civil form of intercourse, which I do not doubt we shall be able to keep up, for the admiration and comment of society. She disengaged herself from my embrace and moved toward the house. Come, she added, turning her exquisite head back over her shoulder with a feline caressing grace that she alone possessed. You know there is a famous lady in London who advertises her saleable charms to the outside public by means of her monogram worked into the lace of all her window blinds, thinking it no doubt good for trade. I am not quite so bad as that. You have paid dearly for me, I know. But remember, I as yet wear no jewels but yours, and crave no gifts beyond those you are generous enough to bestow. And my dutiful desire is to give you as much full value as I can for your money. Sybil, you kill me, I cried, tortured beyond endurance. Do you think me so base? I broke off with almost a sob of despair. You cannot help being base she said, steadily regarding me, because you are a man. I am base because I am a woman. If we believed in a god, either of us, we might discover some different way of life and love. Who knows? But neither you nor I have any remnant of faith in a being whose existence all the scientists of the day are ever at work to disprove. We are persistently taught that we are animals and nothing more. Let us therefore not be ashamed of animalism. Animalism and atheism are approved by the scientists and applauded by the press, and the clergy are powerless to enforce the faith they preach. Come, Geoffrey, don't stay mooning like a stricken Parsifal under those pines. Throw away that thing which troubles you, your conscience. Throw it away as you have thrown the book I was lately reading, and consider this. 
that most men of your type take pride and rejoice in being the prey of a bad woman. So you should really congratulate yourself on having one for a wife, one who is so broad-minded, too, that she will always let you have your own way in everything you do, provided you let her have hers. It is the way all marriages are arranged nowadays, at any rate in our set. Otherwise, the tie would be impossible of endurance. Come. We cannot live together on such an understanding, Sybil, I said hoarsely as I walked slowly by her side toward the villa. Oh, yes we can, she averred, a little malign smile playing round her lips. We can do as others do. There is no necessity for us to stand out from the rest like quixotic fools and pose as models to other married people. We should only be detested for our pains. It is surely better to be popular than virtuous. Virtue never pays. See, there is our interesting German waiter coming to inform us that dinner is ready. Please don't look so utterly miserable, for we have not quarrelled, and it would be foolish to let the servants think we have. I made no answer. We entered the house and dined, Sybil keeping up a perfect fire of conversation, to which I replied in mere monosyllables. And after dinner, we went as usual to sit in the illuminated gardens of the adjacent hotel and hear the band. Sybil was known, and universally admired and flattered by many of the people staying there. And, as she moved about among her acquaintances, chatting first with one group and then with another, I sat in moody silence, watching her with increasing wonderment and horror. Her beauty seemed to me like the beauty of the poison flower, which, brilliant in color and perfect in shape, exhales death to those who pluck it from its stem. And that night, when I held her in my arms, and felt her heart beating against my own in the darkness, an awful dread arose in me, a dread as to whether I might not, at some time or other, be tempted to strangle her as she lay on my breast, strangle her as one would strangle a vampire that sucked one's blood and strength away. End of chapter 26「twenty seven of the Sorrows of Satan by Marie Corelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We concluded our wedding tour rather sooner than we had at first intended, and returned to England and Willowsmere Court about the middle of August. I had a vague notion stirring in me that gave me a sort of dim, indefinable consolation, and it was this: I meant to bring my wife and Mavis Clare together believing that the gentle influence of the gracious and happy creature who like a contented bird in its nest dwelt serene in the little domain so near my own might have a softening and wholesome effect upon sibyl's pitiless love of analysis and scorn of all noble ideals the heat in warwickshire was at this time intense the roses were out in their full beauty and the thick foliage of the branching oaks and elms in my grounds afforded grateful shade and repose to the tired body, while the tranquil loveliness of the woodland and meadow scenery comforted and soothed the equally tired mind. After all, there is no country in the world so fair as England, none so richly endowed with verdant forests and fragrant flowers, none that can boast of sweeter nooks for seclusion and romance. In Italy, that land so overpraised by hysterical poseurs, who foolishly deem it admirable to glorify any country save their own. The fields are arid and brown, and parched by the too fervent sun. There are no shady lanes such as England can boast of in all her shires. And the mania among Italians for ruthlessly cutting down their finest trees has not only actually injured the climate, but has so spoilt the landscape that it is difficult to believe at all in its once renowned and still erroneously reported charm. Such a bower of beauty as Lily Cottage was in that sultry August could never have been discovered in all the length and breadth of Italy. Mavis superintended the care of her gardens herself. She had two gardeners, who under her directions kept the grass and trees continually watered, and nothing could be imagined more lovely than the picturesque old-fashioned house, covered with roses and tufts of jessamine, that seemed to tie up the roof in festal knots and garlands, while around the building spread long reaches of deep emerald lawn, and bosky arbors of foliage, 
where all the most musical songbirds apparently found refuge and delight and where at evening a perfect colony of nightingales kept up a bubbling fountain of delicious melody i remember well the afternoon warm languid and still when i took sibyl to see the woman author she had so long admired the heat was so great that in our own grounds all the birds were silent but when we approached lily cottage the first thing we heard was the piping of a thrush up somewhere among the roses a mellow liquid warble expressing sweet content and mingling with the subdued coo-cooings of the dove reviewers who were commenting on whatever pleased or displeased them in the distance what a pretty place it is said my wife as she peeped over the gate and through the odorous tangles of honeysuckle and jessamine i really think it is prettier than willowsmere it has been wonderfully improved we were shown in and mavis who had expected our visit did not keep us waiting long and she entered clad in some gossamer white stuff that clung softly about her pretty figure and was belted in by a simple ribbon an odd sickening pang went through my heart the fair untroubled face the joyous yet dreamy student eyes the sensitive mouth and above all the radiant look of happiness that made the whole expression of her features so bright and fascinating taught me in one flash of conviction all that a woman might be and all that she too frequently is not and i had hated mavis clare i had even taken up my pen to deal her a wanton blow through the medium of anonymous criticism but this was before i knew her before i realized that there could be any difference between her and the female scarecrows who so frequently pose as novelists without being able to write correct english and who talk in public of their copy with the glibness gained from grub street and the journalist's cheap restaurant yes i had hated her and now now almost i loved her sibyl tall queenly and beautiful gazed upon her with eyes that expressed astonishment as well as admiration to think that you are the famous mavis clare she said smiling as she held out her hand i always heard and knew that you did not look at all literary but i never quite realized that you could be exactly what i see you are to look literary does not always imply that you are literary returned mavis laughing a little too often i am afraid you will find that women who take pains to look literary are ignorant of literature but how glad i am to see you lady sibyl do you know i used to watch you playing about on the lawns at willowsmere when i was quite a little girl and i used to watch you responded sibyl you used to make daisy chains and cowslip balls in the fields opposite on the other side of the avon it is a great pleasure to me to know we are neighbors you must come and see me often at willowsmere mavis did not answer immediately she busied herself in pouring out tea and dispensing it to both of us sibyl who was always on the alert for glimpses of character noticed that she did not answer and repeated her words coaxingly you will come will you not as often as you like the oftener the better we must be friends you know mavis looked up then a frank sweet smile in her eyes do you really mean it she asked mean it echoed sibyl why of course i do how can you doubt it i exclaimed well you must both forgive me for asking such a question said mavis still smiling but you see you are now among what are called the county magnates and county magnates consider themselves infinitely above all authors she laughed outright and her blue eyes twinkled with fun i think many of them estimate writers of books as some sort of strange outgrowth of humanity that is barely decent it is deliciously funny and always amuses me nevertheless among my many faults the biggest one is i fancy pride and a dreadfully obstinate spirit of independence now to tell you the truth i have been asked by many so-called great people to their houses and when i have gone i have generally been sorry for it afterwards why i asked they honor themselves by inviting you oh i don't think they take it in that way at all she replied shaking her fair head demurely they fancy they have performed a great act of condescension whereas it is really i who condescend for it is very good of me you know 
to leave the society of the palace athena in my study for that of a flounced and frizzled lady of fashion her bright smile again irradiated her face and she went on once i was asked to luncheon with a certain baron and baroness who invited a few guests to meet me so they said i was not introduced to more than one or two of these people the rest sat and stared at me as if i were a new kind of fish or fowl then the baron showed me his house and told me the prices of his pictures and his china he was even good enough to explain which was dresden and which was delftware though i believe benighted author as i am i could have instructed him equally on these and other matters however i managed to smile amicably through the whole program and professed myself charmed and delighted in the usual way but they never asked me to visit them again and unless indeed they wanted me to be impressed with their furniture catalogue i can never make out what i did to be asked at all and what i have done never to be asked any more they must have been parvenus said sibyl indignantly no well-bred people would have priced their goods to you unless they happened to be jews mavis laughed a merry little laugh like a peal of bells then she continued well i will not say who they were I must keep something for my literary reminiscences when I get old. Then all these people will be named and go down to posterity as Dante's enemies went down to Dante's hell. I have only told you the incident just to show you why I asked you if you meant it when you invited me to visit you at Willowsmere. Because the Baron and Baroness I have spoken of gushed over me and my poor books to such an extent that you would have fancied I was to be forevermore one of their dearest friends and they didn't mean it. Other people I know embrace me effusively and invite me to their houses, and they don't mean it. And when I find out these shams, I like to make it very clear on my own side that I do not seek to be embraced or invited, and that if certain great folk deem it a favor to ask me to their houses, I do not so consider it, but rather think the favor is entirely on my part if I accept the invitation. And I do not say this for my own self at all, self has nothing to do with it but i do say it and strongly assert it for the sake of the dignity of literature as an art and profession if a few other authors would maintain this position we might raise the standard of letters by degrees to what it was in the old days of scott and byron i hope you do not think me too proud on the contrary i think you are quite right said sibyl earnestly and i admire you for your courage and independence some of the aristocracy are, I know, such utter snobs that often I feel ashamed to belong to them. But as far as we are concerned, I can only assure you that if you will honor us by becoming our friend as well as neighbor, you shall not regret it. Do try and like me if you can. She bent forward with a witching smile on her fair face. Mavis looked at her seriously and admiringly. How beautiful you are! she said frankly everybody tells you this of course still i cannot help joining in the general chorus to me a lovely face is like a lovely flower i must admire it beauty is quite a divine thing and though i am often told that the plain people are always the good people i never can quite believe it nature is surely bound to give a beautiful face to a beautiful spirit Sibyl, who had smiled with pleasure at the first words of the open compliment paid her by one of the most gifted of her own sex, now flushed deeply. "'Not always, Miss Clare,' she said, veiling her brilliant eyes beneath the droop of her long lashes. "'One can imagine a fair fiend as easily as a fair angel.' "'True,' and Mavis looked at her musingly. Then suddenly laughing in her blithe, bright way, she added, "'Quite true.' really i cannot picture an ugly fiend for the fiends are supposed to be immortal and i am convinced that immortal ugliness has no part in the universe downright hideousness belongs to humanity alone and an ugly face is such a blot on creation that we can only console ourselves by the reflection that it is fortunately perishable and that in course of time the soul behind it will be released from its ill-formed husk and will be allowed to wear a fairer aspect yes lady sibyl I will come to Willowsmere. I cannot refuse to look upon such loveliness as yours as often as I may. You are a charming flatterer, 
said Sybil, rising and putting an arm round her in that affectionate, coaxing way of hers, which seemed so sincere, and which so frequently meant nothing. But I confess, I prefer to be flattered by a woman rather than by a man. Men say the same things to all women. They have a very limited repertoire of compliments, and they will tell a fright she is beautiful if it happens to serve their immediate purpose. But women themselves can so hardly be persuaded to admit that any good qualities exist, either inwardly or outwardly in one another, that when they do say a kind or generous thing of their own sex, it is a wonder worth remembering. May I see your study? Mavis willingly assented, and we all three went into the peaceful sanctum where the marble palace presided, and where the dogs Trixie and Emperor were both ensconced. Emperor, sitting up on his haunches and surveying the prospect from the window, and Trixie, with a most absurd air of importance, imitating the larger animal's attitude precisely, at a little distance off. Both creatures were friendly to my wife and to me, and while Sybil was stroking the St. Bernard's massive head, Mavis said suddenly, "'Where is the friend who came with you here first, Prince Rimenez? "'He is in St. Petersburg just now,' I answered. "'But we expect him in two or three weeks to stay with us on a visit for some time.' "'He is surely a very singular man,' said Mavis thoughtfully. "'Do you remember how strangely my dogs behaved to him? "'Emperor was quite restless and troublesome for two or three hours after he had gone.' And in a few words she told Sybil the incident of the St. Bernard's attack upon Lucio. "'Some people have a natural antipathy to dogs,' said Sybil, as she heard. "'And the dogs always find it out and resent it. But I should not have thought Prince Rimenez had an antipathy to any creatures except women.' And she laughed a trifle bitterly. "'Except women,' echoed Mavis, surprisedly. "'Does he hate women? He must be a very good actor, then.' for to me he was wonderfully kind and gentle. Sybil looked at her intently, and was silent for a minute. Then she said, Perhaps it is because he knows you are unlike the ordinary run of women, and have nothing in common with their usual trumpery aims. Of course, he is always courteous to our sex, but I think it is easy to see that his courtesy is often worn as a mere mask to cover a very different feeling. "'You have perceived that, then, Sybil?' I said, with a slight smile. "'I should be blind if I had not perceived it,' she replied. "'I do not, however, blame him for his pet aversion. "'I think it makes him all the more attractive and interesting.' "'He is a great friend of yours?' inquired Mavis, looking at me as she put the question. "'The very greatest friend I have,' I replied quickly. "'I owe him more than I can ever repay.' Indeed, I have to thank him even for introducing me to my wife. I said the words unthinkingly and playfully, but as I uttered them, a sudden shock affected my nerves, a shock of painful memory. Yes, it was true. I owed to him, to Lucio, the misery, fear, degradation, and shame of having such a woman as Sybil was, united to me till death should us part. I felt myself turning sick and giddy and I sat down in one of the quaint oak chairs that helped to furnish Mavis Clare's study, allowing the two women to pass out of the open French window into the sunlit garden together, the dogs following at their heels. I watched them as they went, my wife, tall and stately, attired in the newest and most fashionable mode, Mavis, small and slight, with her soft white gown and floating waist ribbon, the one sensual, the other spiritual, the one base and vicious in desire, the other pure-souled and aspiring to noblest ends, the one a physically magnificent animal, the other merely sweet-faced and ideally fair like a sylph of the woodlands. And looking, I clenched my hands as I thought with bitterness of spirit what a mistaken choice I had made. In the profound egotism which had always been part of my nature, I now actually allowed myself to believe that I might, had I chosen, have wedded Mavis Clare, never for one moment imagining that all my wealth would have been useless to me in such a quest, and that I might as well have proposed to pluck a star from the sky, as to win a woman who was able to read my nature thoroughly, and who would never have come down to my money level from her intellectual throne. No, not though I had been a monarch of many nations. 
I stared at the large tranquil features of the palace Athena, and the blank eyeballs of the marble goddess appeared to regard me in turn with impassive scorn. I glanced round the room, and at the walls adorned with the wise sayings of poets and philosophers, sayings that reminded me of truths which I knew, yet never accepted as practicable, and presently my eyes were attracted to a corner near the writing desk which I had not noticed before, where there was a small dim lamp burning. Above this lamp an ivory crucifix gleamed white against draperies of dark purple velvet. Below it, on a silver bracket, was an hourglass through which the sand was running in glistening grains, and round the entire little shrine was written in letters of gold, Now is the acceptable time. The word now being in larger characters than the rest. Now was evidently Mavis's motto, to lose no moment but to work, to pray, to love, to hope, to thank God and be glad for life, all in the now, and neither to regret the past nor forebode the future, but simply do the best that could be done, and leave all else in childlike confidence to the divine will. I got up restlessly. The sight of the crucifix curiously annoyed me, and I followed the path my wife and Mavis had taken through the garden. I found them looking in at the cage of the Athenium owls, the owl-in-chief being as usual puffed out with his own importance, and swelling visibly with indignation and excess of feather. Sybil turned as she saw me. Her face was bright and smiling. "'Miss Clare has very strong opinions of her own, Geoffrey," she said. "'She is not as much captivated by Prince Rimenez as most people are. In fact, she has just confided to me that she does not quite like him. Mavis blushed, but her eyes met mine with fearless candor. It is wrong to say what one thinks, I know, she murmured in somewhat troubled accents, and it is a dreadful fault of mine. Please forgive me, Mr. Tempest. You tell me the Prince is your greatest friend, and I assure you I was immensely impressed by his appearance when I first saw him. But afterwards, after I had studied him a little, the conviction was borne in upon me that he was not altogether what he seemed. That is exactly what he says of himself, I answered, laughing a little. He has a mystery, I believe, and he has promised to clear it up for me some day. But I'm sorry you don't like him, Miss Clare, for he likes you. Perhaps when I meet him again my ideas may be different, said Mavis, gently. At present, well, do not let us talk of it any more. Indeed, I feel I have been very rude to express any opinion at all concerning one for whom you and Lady Sybil have so great a regard. But somehow I seemed impelled, almost against my will, to say what I did just now. Her soft eyes looked pained and puzzled, and to relieve her and change the subject I asked if she was writing anything new. Oh, yes, she replied. It would never do for me to be idle. The public are very kind to me, and no sooner have they read one thing of mine than they clamor for another, so I am kept very busy. And what of the critics? I asked, with a good deal of curiosity. She laughed. I never pay the least attention to them, she answered, except when they are hasty and misguided enough to write lies about me, then I very naturally take the liberty to contradict those lies, either through my own statement or that of my lawyers. Apart from refusing to allow the public to be led into a false notion of my work and aims, I have no grudge whatever against the critics. They are generally very poor, hard-working men, and have a frightful struggle to live. I have often, privately, done some of them a good turn without their knowledge. A publisher of mine sent me a manuscript the other day, by one of my deadliest enemies in the press, and stated that my opinion would decide its rejection or acceptance. I read it through, and though it was not very brilliant work, it was good enough, so I praised it as warmly as I could, and urged its publication, with the stipulation that the author should never be told I had had the casting vote. It has just come out, I see, and I'm sure I hope it will succeed. Here she paused to gather a few deep damask roses, which she handed to Sybil. Yes, critics are very badly, even cruelly paid, she went on musingly. It is not to be expected that they should write eulogies of the successful author, while they continue unsuccessful. Such work could not be anything but gall and wormwood to them. I know the poor little wife of one of them, and settled her dressmaker's bill for her, because she was afraid to show it to her husband. The very week afterwards, 
he slashed away at my last book in the most approved style in the paper on which he is employed and got i suppose about a guinea for his trouble of course he didn't know about his little wife and her dunning dressmaker and he never will know because i have bound her over to secrecy but why do you do such things asked sibyl astonished i would have let his wife get into the county court for her bill if i had been you would you and mavis smiled gravely well i could not you know who it was that said bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you besides the poor little woman was frightened to death at her own expenditure it is pitiful you know to see the helpless agonies of people who will live beyond their incomes they suffer much more than the beggars in the street who make frequently more than a pound a day by merely whining and snivelling the critics are much more in evil case than the beggars few of them make even a pound a day and of course they regard as their natural enemies the authors who make thirty to fifty pounds a week i assure you i am very sorry for critics all around they are the least regarded and worst rewarded of all the literary community and i never bother myself at all about what they say of me except as i before observed when in their haste they tell lies then of course it becomes necessary for me to state the truth in simple self-defence as well as by way of duty to my public but as a rule i hand over all my press notices to Trixie there indicating the minute yorkshire terrier who followed closely at the edge of her white gown and he tears them to indistinguishable shreds in about three minutes she laughed merrily and sibyl smiled watching her with the same wonder and admiration that had been expressed in her looks more or less since the beginning of our interview with this light-hearted possessor of literary fame we were now walking towards the gate preparatory to taking our departure may i come and talk to you sometimes my wife said suddenly in her prettiest and most pleading voice it would be such a privilege you can come whenever you like in the afternoons replied mavis readily the mornings belong to a goddess more dominant even than beauty work you never work at night i asked indeed no i never turn the ordinances of nature upside down as i am sure i should get the worst of it if i made such an attempt the night is for sleep and i use it thankfully for that blessed purpose some authors can only write at night though i said then you may be sure they only produced blurred pictures and indistinct characterization said mavis some i know there are who invite inspiration through gin or opium as well as through the midnight influences but i do not believe in such methods morning and a freshly rested brain are required for literary labour that is if one wants to write a book that will last for more than one season she accompanied us to the gate and stood under the porch her big dog beside her and the roses waving high over her head at any rate work agrees with you said sibyl fixing upon her a long intent almost envious gaze you look perfectly happy i am perfectly happy she answered smiling i have nothing in all the world to wish for except that i may die as peacefully as i have lived may that day be far distant i said earnestly she raised her soft meditative eyes to mine thank you she responded gently but i do not mind when it comes so long as it finds me ready she waved her hand to us as we left her and turned the corner of the lane and for some minutes we walked on slowly in absolute silence then at last sibyl spoke i quite understand the hatred there is in some quarters for mavis clare she said i am afraid i begin to hate her myself i stopped and stared at her astonished and confounded you begin to hate her you and why are you so blind that you cannot perceive why she retorted the little malign smile i knew so well playing round her lips because she is happy because she has no scandals in her life and because she dares to be content one longs to make her miserable but how to do it she believes in a god she thinks all he ordains is right and good with such a firm faith as that she would be happy in a garret earning but a few pence a day I see now perfectly how she has won her public. It is by the absolute conviction she has herself of the theories of life she tries to instill. What can be done against her? Nothing. But I understand why the critics would like to quash her. 
If I were a critic, fond of whiskey and soda, and music hall women, I should like to quash her myself for being so different to the rest of her sex. What an incomprehensible woman you are, Sybil! I exclaimed with real irritation. You admire Miss Clare's books. You have always admired them. You have asked her to become your friend, and almost in the same breath you aver you would like to quash her or to make her miserable. I confess I cannot understand you. Of course you cannot, she responded tranquilly, her eyes resting upon me with a curious expression, as we paused for an instant under the deep shade of a chestnut tree before entering our own grounds. I never suppose you could, and unlike the ordinary femme incompris, I have never blamed you for your want of comprehension. It has taken me some time to understand myself, and even now I am not quite sure that I have gauged the depths or shallowness of my own nature correctly. But on this matter of Mavis Clare, can you not imagine that badness may hate goodness? That the confirmed drunkard may hate the sober citizen? That the outcast may hate the innocent maiden? And that it is possible that I, reading life as I do, and finding it loathsome in many of its aspects, distrusting men and women utterly, and being destitute of any faith in God, may hate, yes, hate. And she clenched her hand on a tuft of drooping leaves, and scattered the green fragments at her feet. A woman who finds life beautiful and God existent, who takes no part in our social shams and slanders, and who, in place of my self-torturing spirit of analysis, has secured an enviable fame and the honor of thousands, allied to a serene content? Why, it would be something worth living for, to make such a woman wretched for once in her life. But as she is constituted, it is impossible to do. She turned from me and walked slowly onward. I followed in a pained silence. If you do not mean to be her friend, you should tell her so, I said presently. You heard what she said about pretended protestations of regard? I heard, she replied morosely. She is a clever woman, Geoffrey you may trust her to find me out without any explanation. As she said this, I raised my eyes and looked full at her. Her exceeding beauty was becoming almost an agony to my sight, and in a sudden fool's paroxysm of despair I exclaimed, Oh, Sybil, Sybil, why were you made as you are? Ah, why indeed, she rejoined with a faint mocking smile. And why, being made as I am, was I born an earl's daughter? If I had been a drab of the street, I should have been in my proper place, and novels would have been written about me, and plays, and I might have become such a heroine as should cause all good men to weep for joy because of my generosity in encouraging their vices. But, as an earl's daughter, respectfully married to a millionaire, I'm a mistake of nature. Yet nature does make mistakes sometimes, Geoffrey, and when she does, they are generally irremediable. We had now reached our own grounds, and I walked, in miserable mood, beside her, across the lawn towards the house. Sybil, I said at last, I had hoped you and Mavis Clare might be friends. She laughed. So we shall be friends, I dare say, for a little while, she replied. But the dove does not willingly consort with the raven, and Mavis Clare's way of life and studious habits would be, to me, insufferably dull. Besides, as I said before, she, as a clever woman and a thinker, is too clear-sighted not to find me out in the course of time. But I will play humbug as long as I can. If I can perform the part of my county lady or patron, of course she won't stand me for a moment. I shall have to assume a much more different roulé than that of an honest woman. Again she laughed, a cruel little laugh that chilled my blood and paced slowly into the house through the open windows of the drawing-room. And I, left alone in the garden among the nodding roses and waving trees, felt that the beautiful domain of Willowsmere had suddenly grown hideous and bereft of all its former charm, and was nothing but a haunted house of desolation, haunted by an all-dominant and ever-victorious spirit of evil. End of chapter 27